It's February 1st, and you are back with us here on Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen. Welcome back. I love the attitude with that. <laughs> it is. I don't just know. Something comes over me every time. It's just a thing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Danielle, I feel like we've been waiting for this moment for about five years, coming up on five years. Wow. It is one of our best topics. The one that we hear about most at CrimeCon. There was a t-shirt made last year. It was fantastic because who honestly could forget most bizarre weapons? And we were just little baby podcasters when we did that. Our crime after crime story finding skills have been sharpened like a dangerous pair of hot dog tongs. And our storytelling skills have heated up like wasabi pants. I cannot wait to hear these new stories, but first it's time to see what happened with the results of our last episode, which I really enjoyed. I hope you did too. Blame the paranormal. Danielle Ooh. told, yeah, it was a good one. It mm -hmm. was a good one. Danielle told the story of a family that tried to conduct their own exorcism and maybe should have actually called in the pros instead, while I went into a story about a man who took a young girl camping and reportedly got her kidnapped by Bigfoot. I'm not buying it. I'm still not buying nope, it. Nope, still not buying it either. <laughs> anyway, it was close, but there was a clear winner. How did it all play out, Danielle? All right, you guys, on Twitter. I received 54% of the votes and John Ooh. received 46. That's pretty close. 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 I kind of felt like it would be that way though, because I, both of our stories were for the first time actually very different. <laughs> yeah, they were. That's true. And they're both very interesting. Yeah. Um, and it essentially carried over to the website poll as well. I received 56% of the votes and John received 44%. So the people have spoken. They have. And I will happily hand this over to you, Danielle. You get the mug back for this oh, month. Thank goodness. But Unfortunately, don't hold... my tea is already in a different mug. <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> so even though I can use it now, I can't even yeah. actually use it. Well, I've got my tea in the Lacucci mug. Lacucci so. mug. Thank you again to the listener that sent this in. <laughs> oh, goodness. Today, we are looking for more bizarre weapons. And we thought we'd start by reviewing a few that are featured on the FBI's website. Many are objects that look like something else. A keychain that looks like a silver dollar, but actually houses a knife. A working lighter that also houses a knife. Money clip? Nope. It's actually a knife. What about a house key? Nope. Mm -mm. Knife. Danielle. Necklace? No, knifeless. Yes, but John, look, a beautiful crucifix. There's no way that someone would. Yes, yes, Danielle, they did. They turned it into a knife. You know, I feel like I'm starting to see a trend here, John, but you know what's better? I can what? one up this. A knife that secretly houses a gun. I'm not joking. It's a <laughs> knife that has one end that can fire a single 22 caliber bullet. Uh, Danielle, all of those make sense except that last one. I mean, wouldn't it get confiscated because it already looked like a weapon? Honestly, if people thought things through, John, we would not have the show. <laughs> it's very true. It's very true. <laughs> Jeez. Well, let's get to the first story for Most Bizarre Weapons Part 2, told by the super talented Danielle Hallen, who might also house a knife. Oh, my goodness. Actually, no. Knives scare me. Just kidding. I do have a boot knife. I was telling John about this. That's the only knife I have, okay? And Ooh. it's just in case things happen on the farm. I got to be prepared. <laughs> don't be don't be messing with her on the farm. She'll reach into the boot. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, you guys. I've been waiting for this moment, okay? After airing our first episode and being shocked at the use of hot dog tongs and wasabi pants as weapons, I genuinely felt like bizarre weapons were probably just a fluke, you know, like we managed to find these one off situations where someone was like, hey, I'm going to attack another human being with something absolutely bizarre. And unlike other episodes, I actually never have like looked back in this time that's passed to see if there's anything else that's happened. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't sure what to expect going into this. But man, why is this as common <laughs> as it is? Honestly, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a, question, a hard search. Wasn't no, a hard search for me either. <laughs> it was not. And you guys, when I found the story, 
it was just it's all too perfect so rory woods was a successful home remodeling contractor in the early 2000s and if you guys remember anything at all about that time there was like this massive housing boom it began somewhere around like 2005 the lending was easy it honestly reminds me a lot of like the past few years people were pocketing all sorts of money this is when flipping houses became a huge thing um, my dad was actually a contractor. And so that was kind of like the world I lived in at this time. And I remember how crazy it was. But I also remember how quickly the housing boom turned into a massive housing crisis. Yeah. And Rory Woods was caught up in the middle of all of this. Now, she had just purchased a four bedroom colonial home in Western Massachusetts and followed that with a rental property to get a little bit of extra income. It was just down the street. And for a year, things were great. And it wasn't even actually the housing crisis that started all of the problems. Unfortunately, in 2006, she ended up injured on the job. Remodeling houses, you can't work on them <laughs> while you're injured, okay? It is a very physical task. It took her out of work. And so slowly, she began to fall behind on a lot of her payments. And with all of this financial struggle and stress, she was desperately looking for some sort of out, obviously. And that required going through her lending paperwork. And unfortunately, this hit her with another problem. She had likely been a victim of predatory lending. Mm. So... This whole thing scared me, man. It made me relook over all of my mortgage. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm so serious. It's well, of because of everything. Panic. Yeah, because of everything yeah. that happened back then, um, like lending papers, there was literally laws that kicked in about like they had to simplify them because yeah. they would they were written in a way that was so confusing. there were so many pages yeah. and it was intentionally confusing so that they could yeah. slip in things like that Whew. um i bought a house right after the bus mm -hmm. and i swear the the lending or all of the papers for that i think it was only like 30 sheets for everything That's which not bad. was nothing yeah. compared to like i had bought a house before that and it was mm -hmm. i mean you had like a book basically when you were done of all these different <sighs> pages yeah no thank you okay i had enough stress when i bought my first house like a little over a year ago i could not even imagine yeah, yeah but basically she was looking at her paperwork and on both of her mortgages she found problems so one of them was essentially designed to lead to foreclosure no matter what like it was just you know i don't know how people can do that but and the other one i guess the loan itself seemed okay but it seemed to discriminate against her it like wrote in there multiple times that she was a single work like working woman and that's it so she was like okay I'm trapped into really strange, probably not great mortgages. And, you know, I can't work right now, despite the fact that there is a big boom. And so she felt the only way out of the situation was to file Chapter 7 bankruptcy. And at that point, she can get back up on her feet, continue working, wouldn't lose the homes that she had put a lot of like time into. And while she did, in fact, you know, end up being successful filing bankruptcy, things did not get easier because 2008, man, that crisis began. Yeah. Yeah, it did. And it was rough. And so obviously, during that time, nobody needed a contractor, because people were struggling to even pay their mortgages on their homes they had, let alone remodel, they definitely were not buying new ones <laughs> at all. And so she was forced to make another hard decision. She left her contracting job. And she's like, you know, I need something. So she turned towards a hobby that she had had for years, hoping that it would make her some sort of money. Beekeeping, super random. Hmm. And so she had kept bees since the early 90s and was heavily inspired by this beekeeper known to advocate for the therapeutic use of bee stings, which is very interesting as a beekeeper myself to hear that. And she's like, you know what, I'm going to take this to the next level. So she added to her apiary and pretty soon she was trading and selling a good amount of honey. And y'all, I don't know if you know <laughs> what a lucrative business that is. Honey is expensive. Yeah. Like yeah. incredibly expensive. And so this was enough to get her by, make her comfortable after she claimed, quote, her quality of life had been destroyed by this wrongful predatory loan. But unfortunately, her fight was far from over. She fought for the next decade to not lose her properties. And she was a very passionate woman. This loan had put her through the ringer. She had multiple foreclosure notices, filed for bankruptcy a second time. Mm. And then in 2018, her efforts... I mean, she had done basically all she could. And so her colonial home that she loved so much was auctioned off to another couple. Man. 
I left her homeless. Yeah. And so she was sleeping in tents, essentially. Um, but she was still trying so hard to make money, get herself back on her feet. So she, you know, was keeping her bees. Every penny she made went towards them and their care. They were kind of like bouncing around all these different homes, like locations of friends, hoping she could, you know, get through this rough patch. She was continuing to fight in lawsuits, over 40 to be exact. Oof. And I know it's wild. I didn't even realize like how deep this sort of situation can get. Um, and she totally submerged herself in law to be able to properly defend herself. And eventually she found the MAAPL, which is the Massachusetts Alliance Against Predatory Lending. And, you know, she knew what she had been through with the knowledge and experience she had gained at this point over, you know, a handful of years. So she basically vowed to help others who were going through the same thing. And this is where she met an elderly man named Alton King Jr. So Alton King Jr., had been raised by his parents in poverty and he grew up basically watching his father denied job after job due to racism and you know all sorts of discrimination and it made it very difficult for his family to thrive and so after seeing this he had made it up in his mind he's like i am not going to be stopped like i'm going to work as hard as i can um, to get out of where i am and live a very comfortable life and he was actually able to successfully do this and early on in his adulthood he moved to his very first home in longmeadow massachusetts and he remembers like getting to this home and he thought it was just like the best thing in the entire world and he said it kind of sucked because there was like a contractor, someone nearby that he was like bragging to. He's like, hey, like, look at my house, look what I have. And I guess he found out the hard way in that time that he was actually living in a very bad place. <laughs> oh, um, gotcha. But like to him, you know, he's worked from the bottom up to get this. Um, and this home ended up being nothing compared to where he would live years later. Elton was very successful. Okay financial advisor, making lots of money. He was very well respected and known in the community as an activist, as a volunteer. Um, he was known to play the piano beautifully, played a mean game of chess. He like volunteered at schools. Like everybody knows this guy. And all of his hard work had paid off because in 2002, he moved to 49 Memory Lane in Longmeadow. This home is almost 10,000 square feet. Mm, wow. Seven bedrooms, nine bathrooms is currently worth $1.5 million. And so he has literally brought himself from the bottom to the top, worked his absolute hardest his entire life to get to this point. And so in 2006, after a few years of living in the home, he's like, you know what? I want to build like a big full-sized indoor basketball court because he loved playing basketball his whole life. He wanted to be able to give back to his mom and he wanted to make an apartment for her. She was aging. He wanted her to have a safe place to live. Um, you know, it's just like a beautiful story, you know, like this sounds like something out of a movie. And so he received a construction loan for just over $400,000 and the work began. And the basketball court was like the jewel of the home. Um, he would spend as much time as he could on the court. That's where his family would get together. Again, being very active in the community, he actually opened it up to a lot of different local leagues to come and play. Um, it was great. But he began to realize that he had fallen into an awful trap. No, this loan, the construction <clears throat> yeah. loan, no. So despite being told and believing that adding this to his property would increase the value, he had it appraised shortly afterwards and his home actually lost value. And so that in itself was devastating enough, okay? <laughs> well, let's um, be honest, like how many people, because it's it's the likability of the place and exactly. how many families are going to be like, yeah, I want an indoor basketball court like that. <laughs> That exactly. just limits the, the potential mm -hmm. buyers. So it makes sense exactly. that it actually affected the value in, in that way. But apparently he was told, oh, yeah, this is going to, you know, part of the plan. Oh, yeah. um, now, additionally, as if that was not enough, his original amount that had been added to his mortgage was $3,000. Okay. Okay. Over the course of a few years, it inflated to $14,000. He had an adjustable rate on it. The loan uh, had come with a negative amortization rate. Did I pronounce that right? I, I negative don't know. amortization to, rate. Yeah. Don't Google it. Okay. Just don't. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm obviously not a professional. Okay. I had my hand held through the whole entire buying process. Yeah. But yeah. to put it as basic, like the most basic way that I can, 
and it's very complicated, so do not quote me on this, but essentially the way that a negative amortization rate works is that the interest is so high that even when you're paying the amount owed, like literally the bank's like, oh, this is what you owe every month. Little do they tell you, you're not covering the, yeah, yeah. enough to cover the interest that's due every month. Like you are just digging yourself into a hole. And so essentially what happens is your monthly payment increases like by a lot every single month until all of a sudden you're drowning in it. Yeah. It's, it's like, it, it, it sounds like it's a balloon that's made to pop. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Right. Essentially, that's exactly what it is. And, you know, it's weird because Google does try to convince you that it's good in some circumstances. I don't know what circumstance I could ever be beneficial in, but yeah. there are a lot of stipulations on loans like that, at least now, because of the risk that they pose. And unfortunately, it was like one of the main methods used in predatory loans because it just, it sets you up for failure. Right. Yeah. And so he struggled four years to make payments. This man worked his butt off to try to make this work. But unfortunately, by 2015, so we're talking almost 10 years later, wow. he's like, I can't do this anymore. You know, he is massively behind on payments um, and they, he's facing foreclosure, you know. And so he ended up reaching out to the MAAPL for support. And this whole group of people kind of became the support system for each other because they're like, this is, you know, for him, like, this could be discrimination. Like, this is, should be illegal. Like, what is going on? And by the time, you know, he's really knee deep in this, he was fighting at this point for years, trying to put stays on evictions. We hit another crisis, the pandemic. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, it's just one great crisis after another. I'm really <laughs> loving the story so far. Right. <laughs> so... Basically, we all have lived through this and people started getting evicted left and right. This is before a lot of the different things were put into place. And so those involved in the MAAPL were devastated because these situations, it's not just a, oh, I got screwed over on a loan and I'm going to fight against this for like six months to a year. These people had been in legal battles for some of them decades, like plural. Yeah, it's their life savings. I mean, it's exactly. Yeah, it's their <clears throat> biggest asset. And it's in a way almost unfortunate that they yeah. did the right thing and actually held on to the loans because there was a lot of relief stuff that happened uh, a few years after mm -hmm. the, the big fall in mm -hmm. 2008. So it's a weird thing to think about like, well, he was just doing the right thing. He kept paying the loan, but now he's still hitting the same end. Exactly. Where if he would have taken advantage maybe of some of those programs that happened, because it was recognized that, oh, okay, a lot of these loans are terrible. This should have never happened this way. There was a time to kind of cash in on that. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like he kind of missed it. Well, and I also think from, like, I didn't add this into, obviously, the story I was going to tell, but I did, like, a little bit of back search on things like that. And I guess the original place that he secured the loan through mm -hmm. went out of business almost immediately. Oh, and yeah. so his loan started being just tossed around from company to company to company. And so by yep. the time he would try to do something about it, before anything could get done, like the the company would hold things so there would no be no hearings, there would be nothing. They would postpone, postpone, and then they'd sell it. And like right. it would just be right. like this. He was chasing his tail. It's kind of like what it seemed like. Yeah. Um. And mm. a lot of them were like, what is the word? It's ghost, you no know, shadow entities or something. Yeah. I don't know. There was something else going on to where like a lot of these places didn't even have like proper legal. I don't know. It was a complicated mess. Yeah. But, you know, basically this whole group, they had spent years attending each other's hearings, reviewing paperwork, documents, giving advice. Um, and, you know, now they're watching the pandemic happen. And this particular area was went from, I think, like one to two evictions a week to three to four a day. Yeah. Before yeah. anything was done. It was bad. And so it was wearing thin on everyone. And during this time, King was basically like at the end of his rope. He had fought as hard as he could. There was like an online petition actually with thousands of signatures asking the Supreme Court to stop his eviction. Like everyone knew him, everyone supported him, but he was stuck. There was nothing else that he could really do. So he ended up slapped with a 72 hour notice to vacate the property and the community and activists were enraged. Basically, you know, he's like, I think in his late 70s at this point, and everyone's like, why would you evict this man? Like, <laughs> come yeah. on. Um, so 
he ended up kind of giving into it a bit, trying to figure out if there were any last things he could do. And Rory Woods was actually one of the individuals there helping him. And they were able to go and tour the facility that he was going to have all of his belongings taken to. Like, I can't even imagine, you know, what something like that would feel like. Um, And at 9.15 a.m. on October 12, 2022, like we're talking just, you know, not that long ago, deputies from Hampton County made their way to Memory Lane to serve like the final like eviction notice. And they showed up with a moving company and everything to start the process of taking the belongings and everything. So when they arrived, King had actually found one last option. So he wasn't even there when they got there. He was at the local courthouse attempting a final stay on his eviction. And so instead, the sheriff's department was face to face with protesters. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So they were fed up. They were tired of it, especially, you know, this older man. And deputies really had no choice but to wait at the home, wait for King to return. He was either going to have a stay on this eviction or they had to begin the process of removing everything. Um, and this meant they basically had to stand there with these very angry protesters. Now, a spokesman for Hampton County Sheriff's Department, Nicholas Kochi, said, quote, we are always prepared for protest when it comes to evictions, but a majority of the groups who protest understand that we are just doing our statutory duty in accordance with the state law. So they actually were like awarded some like achievement for being like one of the most understanding departments. Like they would make sure no one that got evicted went without somewhere to stay that night or ended up on the streets. Like they would provide hotels because they really are just acting out the law. They're like a third party coming into it. Um, They don't like it as much as anyone else does. Um, And so it seems like they'd had, you know, these standoffs before, but that usually these protesters were like, we know you're just doing your job. Not this time. (laughs) (laughs) Little did they know there was one protester that was about to unleash an absolute nightmare on absolutely everybody. So just minutes after authorities had arrived and the moving company had arrived and they're just, you know, twiddling their thumbs, waiting for King to come back, a blue Nissan Xterra SUV pulled into King's driveway and this SUV was pulling a trailer behind it. What is on the trailer, John? Uh, It's not like a big picture of a bee, is it? (laughs) Four to five large beehives. No. Four to five large beehives are on the trailer, John. It no. was Woods, and she had had it up to here, like as far as you can possibly have had it. I guess. So after she hopped out of the car, she made her way towards the beehives in the back, and it did not take long for officers to be like, Oh, no, (laughs) we know exactly what is about to happen here. And one by one, she began to smack the ever loving crap out of the tops of these beehives. Now, it was cold outside. okay, and I think they had this on their side because those bees did not want to go anywhere. It's like low 50s. Bees are not coming out. Honeybees at that time. They are huddled up in their little ball in the center of their hive to stay at like a good 90 degrees. They're, you know. And so it was going to take further persuasion, but don't worry, because Woods was very, very dedicated to her task. Now, one deputy, Michael Joslin, realized what was going on and ran towards Woods, hoping to be able to stop her before chaos ensued. And this just seemed to fuel Woods' fire even more. So she started to violently shake the boxes, hoping to free them of their lids, piss these bees off. And Deputy Jocelyn is right beside her. There's photographs of it where he is like fighting her, pushing her back with his elbow, trying to get these hive tops back on there so these bees don't go crazy. Yeah. But despite his attempts, Wood successfully broke a cover off of the hive, sending hundreds of bees swarming. Now, we have protesters there as well, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like she trained these bees to oh only attack the sheriffs. No, mm mm-mm. So everyone that's at the location Every is now in danger. Every single person there is now in danger. Wow. So Deputy Jocelyn, who was there with her, like there's different kinds of bee boxes you can get. Hers were foam, like a thick foam. Mm-hmm. And so she was able to just snap a corner off. And he ends up, because he's right there in it, stung Oliver's face. So he <sighs> flees at this point. And she was nowhere near done. She is... Continuing to shake these hives, um, deputies panicked. Protesters are scattering. Like, no one's even sure what to do. But protesters, despite this, they're still cheering her on. They're like, woo, release the bees. Like, just 
so on board with what's happening. And obviously being comfortable with bees, she was not super phased by this swarm around her. And so she took like this moment of chaos to zip on her bee jacket so that she could continue her plan safely. Wow. And so wow. here she is in her bee jacket and this massive swarm that she has created. And as if thousands of bees swarming isn't enough, she continues. She flips over a hive entirely, just like straight up flips it off the trailer. Um, she then puts one of the hives onto like, I don't what are they? Like a little dolly thing, rolls it to the front door of the house, opens the bee boxes up. Just like ensuing chaos, you guys. And at this point, authorities can't do a single thing to stop her. The report states, quote, officers at this time attempted to stop Woods, but were attacked by bees. <laughs> no kidding. There was no way to safely reach her in this swarm at all. And the few officers that had tried were stung multiple times, and many of them were forced to flee to protect themselves. It took over 30 minutes for the bees to even slightly calm down. Yeah. And it finally allowed two officers the ability to reach Woods and arrest her. She initially fought against the arrest, but ultimately she was taken to the ground. They were pissed off at this point, like very angry with her. Um, and when she was being handcuffed, the protesters were all like hollering in support of her still. And I don't I wasn't able to find if any of them got stung, but they're just like, don't arrest her. She's just fighting for us. Like, ah. And the officers were like informing her, like, do you know what you just did? Like, you just put so many people in danger. Yeah. Over three officers there were allergic to bees. That's what I was going to ask. Yeah. I mean, is this going to attempted murder charge? Like, where is this going to go? It's... It, it, almost, it almost went there because actually one of the sheriff's office photographers was there. Very allergic to bees, got stung multiple times on the head and was rushed away in an ambulance. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're like, telling her this so like what on earth were you thinking like why would you do this like you have harmed so many people and her response was quote oh you're allergic good Ooh, not nice no not nice <laughs> at all it was a very rude thing to say lady yeah nicholas kochi went on to state quote i support people's right to protest peacefully but when you cross the line and put my staff in public in danger i promise you will be arrested Chief Deputy Robert Hoffman also stated, quote, never in all my years of leading the Hampton County Sheriff's Civil Process Division have I ever seen something like this. I'm just thankful no one died because bee allergies are serious. I hope that these out-of-county protesters will reconsider using such extreme measures in the future because they will be charged and prosecuted. And when approached for interviews after she pulled this whole stunt, like this went absolutely viral. There's so many pictures of it. This photographer that went down, went down with a fight because there's, I mean, just so many pictures of this happening. But she stated, quote, this is not about a few sheriffs getting a few honeybee stings. It's about predatory lending, which is thriving in Massachusetts and beyond. <laughs> so she just totally seemed to fail to understand the seriousness of what she had done. Oh, I mean... This easily could have led to somebody dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, she, just, it's just a different level. I mean, I, I, I get what she's trying to speak up against. Mm -hmm. It's a whole terrible story. It is, yeah. This older man have his home taken away from him, and she's obviously internalizing some of those feelings because of the experience oh, exactly. that she has gone mm -hmm. through as well. Yep. Um, but it's you're not. It's not the loan company that you that you've sicked these bees on. No, you know it's not the issue. It's not the contract that you you guys signed. I know it sounds <clears throat> crappy, yeah. but that was part of what was wrong back then, Danielle. Yeah. It wasn't like some people knew it was wrong. Like I I had friends. I was working mm -hmm. in a company. I had friends that are like, oh, I bought a house this weekend. I'm like, oh, wow, that's awesome. You know, that's cool. Mm -hmm. And then a couple of weeks later, hey, man, I bought another house. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, oh, no, boy. Well, I've got the one I'm going to live in, and then I'm going to use this other one. I'm going to fix it up, and I'm going to turn it into a rental. And then the same friend, like a month later, hey, man, picked up another house. <gasps> like, the loans... No. <laughs> but but you you have to know that it's not right. Like you yeah. have to know. Wait, buying a house was a, a big, big deal. 
big thing, man. It is a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a big deal only a few years ago. But mm -hmm. now all of a sudden something has happened where I'm able to get three house loans on my one name and my one salary. How does that make sense? Ugh. It was it, so it was one of those things where, yeah, it, it was terrible. It does. People, it sucks. Yeah. People were being taken advantage of. But if you were kind of aware of things, you had to know some of it was sounding strange. Like mm -hmm. it was just things were getting weird. And yep. it, that was all pushing this, you know, like all the contractors and all that work mm -hmm. and all the house flipping thing because all of a sudden you'd have three properties. You needed them all tuned up so you could turn the other two into rentals. It was it was just, it was crazy. It was crazy, crazy times, but mm -hmm. it wasn't impossible to see. And it's it sucks. It still yeah. sucks. But taking things to this level, is that the answer? But sicking your bees on like, and like, it's, and like bee allergies, I feel like everyone ever also knows how incredibly dangerous that can be to someone who's allergic my mom is deathly allergic to bees yeah yeah like i put my bees on the farthest point of my property for that exact reason like yeah. through the woods it's absolutely awful like absolutely awful um and she just she didn't seem to care too much um now she ended up being charged with four counts of assault and battery with a dangerous weapon aka the bees like it yeah. literally has parentheses bees <laughs> when you look it up um, and disorderly conduct. And she's very, very lucky because the photographer survived. Thankfully, mm -hmm. it was questionable for a bit, but they publicly stated she's lucky because she was about to be facing manslaughter on top of all of this. Yeah. Um, it could have been way worse than it was. Now, she pleaded not guilty. She is currently awaiting trial. There have been like no more comments from her. Um, but it caused like a whole uproar because, you know, it's kind of unclear if she had spoken out this plan to other activists or potentially King himself. And, you know, it was this a whole orchestrated deal. And it seems from interviews, at least King has made statements that he had absolutely no idea she was going to do that. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't know if she last minute panicked and was like, I'm piling all these bees onto but that, I mean, that takes some, you guys, I have multiple beehives. It takes some effort to do that. So she, she, you have this to was, put some thought into it. Yeah. Yeah. This was premeditated. And like I said, it, this is more of an emotional lash out Absolutely. about her experience. Her and not so much him. Yeah. 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 But, well, and he even stated, he was like, I feel like her act actually overshadowed like my very serious and real problem. And he, he yeah. was, he was, he was like, you know, I'm trying not to judge, put too much judgment down on her is what he said, because he understood where her anger and frustration came from that led her to act the way that she did. But he was like, it's well, still like has taken me and my effort to stop this and like put it out of the spotlight to now like highlight your absolute crazy <laughs> attack yeah. on everyone in the vicinity. So well, and did it stop it, Danielle? What happened? So actually he was able to stay his eviction. Thankfully. Really? This poor 80 year old man couch surfed until November 18th. So for about a month. Um, and then he made the decision to file for bankruptcy. Okay. And so he did that was able to keep the house. I think he was supposed to have another hearing in December, but I have not seen anything else come out, but he, he was able to get his house back at least temporarily while yeah. he still tries to figure things out, which makes me so happy. But I'm just like, dang, like everyone's already freaking going through it. And you had to go and just like release the bees. I know. No, that's insane. Good grief. She, she could Welcome be like to a freaking 2020 through 2022. Let me just tell you, this like story is not surprising at all to me. That is that is certainly a post COVID story, just like the Absolutely. mania that's in that release story. Bees. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that could only come from someone that has survived COVID absolutely like she could be thinking, she could be a villain gone. in a yeah <laughs> she could be a villain in, in like a harry potter story or something uh -huh. the, the beekeeper <gasps> or a batman movie yeah oh my gosh uh, that's legitimately yeah but geez. huge thank you to the washington post new york mag daily hampshire gazette insider.com the western journal and mass live for that wild ride yeah. it took some digging Jeez. everything else i saw was like stuff i saw the first time around I will say that there were a few things, but then I don't even know what I searched to find this. And I was like, 
bees. I have to say, like, because I mean, <laughs> most people know I'm like a beekeeper. I love beekeeping. You just got yeah. into it, and I found this, and I was like, you have got to be joking. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to share that with Lance over at Crawl Space. He also oh, absolutely keeps bees. Yeah. He's like you. What? <laughs> what? Oh my god! All right. Well, Danielle brought it. Can mm -hmm. I match or beat it? We're that gonna have to one. see after this short break. While most kitchens do, how's a secret knife, Danielle? Mm -hmm. Some also have a secret weapon to keep everyone happy. It's HelloFresh. From their fit and wholesome to veggie or family-friendly recipes, you'll always find something for even the pickiest eaters like John. They will enjoy it. She's absolutely right. Plus, not all of us live on a farm, Danielle. Mm -hmm. That's true. Which is why <laughs> their ingredients travel from the farm to your home in less than seven days, putting the fresh into your HelloFresh meal. I love their flatbreads, but last night I got to try a new one. Zucchini, mm. tomatoes, ricotta cheese infused with lemon, topped wow. with some chili flakes and a honey, uh-oh, bees, honey drizzle. Oh no. <laughs> Sounds delicious. <laughs> it was amazing. And I made the whole thing in about 25 minutes. Dinner tasted like it came from my favorite Italian restaurant. All I can say is Lord and Ramsay strikes again. And you don't have to be a celebrity chef or even a fake one. Okay, with pre-portioned ingredients and easy to follow recipe cards, you can get a delicious home cooked dinner on the table without all the meal planning, shopping, prepping. Wait, wait, fake? I was on Netflix, Daniel. Oh, we know, John, you will not let us forget it, okay? Go to hellofresh.com slash crimeaftercrime65 and use code crimeaftercrime65 for 65% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime65 and use code CrimeAfterCrime65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Try America's number one meal kit today. I was in every episode. Yes, John. I know. We, we all know. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I am very excited. John had this story prepped like way in advance. He sent me an email and it sent like a shock of panic through my body. I was like, oh. He already has he already has his case picked out. You must have either been very excited or you had like an inkling of an idea. I had to get I had to Both jump on the research <laughs> before you found it, Danielle. I was worried you were going to find my story. Uh, no, I uh, I just, you know, scheduling just had to do my research early. That's all it was. Didn't mean to freak you out. That's why I put I put in the message. I was like, this is for next week. It's not for this week. <laughs> like, I thought, you knew I, I was going to just totally. I did. <laughs> I did lose my marbles. That's okay yeah. though, because it lit a fire underneath me. Oh, well, so <laughs> sounds like that fire paid off. Cause that B story, whoo, I got some That's work to do one. here. It is wild. Well, in the stories that we told on most bizarre weapon part one, both were about the assailants using the weapon. Mm. This mm -hmm. story shows us that the heroes can also wield some bizarre weapons. Today's story takes us to beautiful Paris, France. The history, the architecture, the romance. Paris is a beautiful city that's been captured by many of the greatest photographers of all time and is visited from people all over the world. Now, while many are familiar with the Louvre Museum, Notre Dame Cathedral, and of course the Eiffel Tower, a less known location you'll find is near the northeast corner of Paris. The Bassin de la Valette or as the locals call it, the Basson de la Villette, is a rectangular lake, 800 meters in length and 70 meters wide, and it's the largest artificial lake in Paris, built back in 1808, with cruise boats stopping there. Danielle's dying. What Sorry, I just, I really enjoyed your pronunciation. Did I nail the, it? The, the original pronunciation was just perfect. <laughs> Yeah, I did a bunch of research. I have to get my pronunciation right. Otherwise, people will uh, beat us up in the comments I've found. So. Oh, I love it. Basson de la Villette. Okay. Uh, with cruise boats stopping there, local businesses include restaurants and clubs, artist studios, and two of the most modern movie theater complexes in all of France. Every June, they have a festival with concerts, shows, and a big fireworks display. The neighborhood has seen a growing number of trendy bars and restaurants populating the streets near that part of the canal. 
It's been referred to as a place of celebration and life. But some also note that, like most areas, there is a darker underbelly to this area as well. In 2018, Paris was in the middle of a wave of knife attacks, a wave that unfortunately seems to continue to today. While some thought that these were acts of organized terrorism and some groups even tried to claim responsibility, the, authority, the authorities were adamant that that just wasn't the case. Well, 2018 featured constant news stories about a new knife attack, just as the news cycle for the previous one was winding down in June. A woman attacked two people with a box cutter in a supermarket. In August, a man stabbed his mother and sister. It was now Sunday, September 9th, just after 11 p.m. on the Basson de la Villette. It was a busy evening with people coming and going from the popular movie complexes, cafes serving food and drinks, and plenty of tourists out with their families enjoying the night air. But suddenly, groups of people were fleeing some in all-out sprints. Five people had already been viciously attacked, but the mm -hmm. attacker was starting to catch attention. A few men were chasing him, and a security guard at the cinemas saw them. Quote, he had an iron bar in his hand, which he threw at the men chasing him. Then he took out a knife. One eyewitness, Yusuf Naja, said that the attacker dove into an alleyway and tried to hide behind a few British tourists who were said to be in their 50s. Yusuf tried to warn the couple that the guy had a knife. Oh, no. But it was too late. The attacker struck again, bringing his victim count up to seven. Bujima Hamani and his two friends were enjoying the evening when they noticed some commotion and initially thought it was just a brawl between a few people who had too much to drink. But then a group of young women came running towards them screaming, he has a knife. The three friends looked at each other and they knew they had to do something. So they grabbed their balls, Danielle. Mm -hmm. And these guys had balls made of steel. Mm -hmm. You see... They were playing Patonk, a game played by 20 million French people. During the summer months, you'll frequently see players in the courtyards all around France. It's a bit of a slow moving game. You'll frequently see elderly people play it, but it's played by people of all ages. Uh, you have one small wooden ball that is lobbed down the courtyard, and then the players have metal balls, also referred to as bulls. Uh, Patonk balls are about the size of a baseball, but where a baseball weighs around five ounces, patonk balls weigh from one and a half to two pounds. Ooh. So mm -hmm. more than five times, about five times heavier than a baseball. And as I previously mentioned, they're made of steel. Uh, players toss their balls. Sorry, <laughs> couldn't resist. Uh, trying to get closest to the wood one, which is called the cochonet. Okay, uh, so it's kind of like bocce ball. I was literally, that was the next sentence. I love bocce ball. <laughs> yeah, quite a bit like bocce ball. But okay. in bocce, you you bowl the ball after like taking a step or two. Mm -hmm. And in patonk, they actually draw a circle and you have to stand with your feet in the circle. Ooh, make it more challenging. Okay. Yeah, and you're using more of like a, a controlled underhand toss. Like the ball's okay. flying more than, than bocce where it's rolling. Ooh, yeah. And, you know, you could use that to help knock an opponent's ball away from the cochonet. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, those type of mechanics of getting closer are definitely like bocce. Of course, you can also use an overhand baseball throw if you're trying to knock out a knife-wielding lunatic. Absolutely. And that's what these men set out to do. Oh, my Bojima, gosh. <laughs> yeah, so they grab, them, they grab their balls, Danielle. They go running <laughs> after this guy. Bojima says, I saw this guy with a knife who was trying to attack people. My first reflex was to run after him, and my mates followed. The attacker soon came into their sights, and that's when they started unloading. We started throwing our patonk balls at him, Bajima would explain. The attacker took off in the other direction with Bajima and his buddies and their balls all in hot pursuit. <laughs> and <laughs> reportedly, others are now joining in on the chase. Oh, like, I can only imagine what that looked like. Yeah, all of a sudden this is turning into a mob. Uh, eyewitness Yusuf would detail there were around 20 people chasing him. They were throwing their balls at him. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he deserves. <laughs> I know. 
Uh, so another one was thrown, and I'm sure that the attacker actually heard a patonk because it nailed him in the head. Ooh. But, but he kept running. And I don't you, know how. I don't either. Yusuf actually says that several hit him in the head, like possibly four or five, but this guy just wasn't stopping. Uh, reports say that the men threw between 20 and 30 balls at the attacker as he tried to flee. And they also threw other stuff that they were just randomly grabbing as this mob was kind yeah, of forming and chasing. Anything them. they could get, yeah. Yeah. Uh, apparently their practice paid off. One of the balls hit the attacker in the arm that was actually holding the knife, but he was able to hold on to it. The hit was hard enough, though, that he lost his balance and fell over. And that's when the men were able to surround the attacker. Uh, a man that joined the that joined the crowd pursuing the attacker named Rita would explain, we managed to circle him, me with a stick, another one with an iron bar. Rita then clocked the guy with the wooden stick. Oh my gosh. <laughs> another citizen threw a broken box at him. Soon several men were on top of the attacker with, oh, it's Rima actually, uh, with Rima successfully wrestling the mm -hmm. knife away from him. Uh, and he says, it was a reaction. I didn't know why I did that. When you're in a group, you can do something. Mm -hmm. Now, this did go kind of full-blown mob mentality. And some yeah. in the angry mob were actually like, we should kill this guy. And others... It is so scary how like, uh, man, your brain can just kind of flip a switch like that. When you get in a group, it's just... Well, and you know, crap out of me, man. <laughs> this guy attacked seven people. Yeah, uh, and so they're a, angry. Yeah, yeah. A, a couple of tourists in their fifties, and that was one of the recent ones where people are actually witnessing that he's attacking yeah. these people. I mean, your emotions, I'm sure, just get so fired up. Um, exactly. But thankfully, there was other parts of the crowd that were like, "No, no, 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 that would make us just as bad as what he's mm -hmm. done," and they were able to kind of keep it controlled. The the men kept him held down until a plainclothes police officer could arrive. That took about three minutes. Uh, Bojima would tell the press that the man seemed to be on drugs. He seemed to be on something. He definitely didn't seem normal. He mm -hmm. had a blank look. He didn't say anything. Even when we hit him, he didn't say, ouch. So he must have been. That's kind of scary. Something. Yeah. That's like really scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, this dude's taken two pound metal balls to the just head. Just repeatedly. Exactly. It's just not stopping. Still. Yeah. Getting clocked by a wooden stick. Doesn't even say, ouch. Like, yeah, there, there has to be something else going yeah. on here. Uh, the suspect was identified as a 36 year old man who was said to have serious mental health problems. And he had mm -hmm. actually been on a terror watch list since 2016. Go good. Yet, right. <laughs> right. Yet the police still claim this is not linked to terrorism. Uh, so mm -hmm. he had attacked seven people in total. At least three of them were tourists. We had the two from Britain and then another tourist from Egypt. Uh, Rima told the media he didn't say anything even when we caught him. Some asked him, why did you do that? But he didn't answer. Even at the time of the attack, he did not utter a word. Uh, Rima had to spend several hours in the police station. The police thanked me. The prosecutor thanked everyone. He stayed at the police station until after 5 a.m. He says it, it took longer because he actually <laughs> held the knife when he was disarming him. So his DNA oh, was... Oh, no. Yeah, his DNA was now on the weapon that was used to harm these people. Well, at the, least there were multiple eyewitnesses to be like, he did not have <laughs> Like oh, he yeah. literally just disarmed him because that, that could be a tricky situation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Patonk players were thanked for their bravery by many, including French interior minister Gerard Colomb, who praised their courage and reactivity. When asked about his bravery, Rima humbly replied, anyone can do that if there's several of us. We need help. One person mm -hmm. alone cannot do something, but I'm happy to have intervened with others. Otherwise, he would have done more damage. There were a lot of people where he was going. He was also concerned about the victim, saying that he hopes that they recover. Of yeah. the seven, it's reported that four required medical care, but were said to be in stable condition. Okay. And one was actually in more serious condition. Uh, however, I can find no casualties reported for this incident. Okay. And the, the right, charges good. that they talked about were all basically attempted murder charges. So I do believe that everyone survives this. It is worth saying the press around this uh, it's really weird because there's this big run of reporting on this when it happened and then it just mm -hmm. gets cut off. Like there's yeah. just no follow-up. The uh, the attacker 
never named. I don't know what happened criminally. Like yeah. everything just, I don't know if that's a thing with French media. I honestly don't look into cases too often from this area, but I was very well, surprised to see that it just, it just got It's kind of like a big tourism area and that community relies on it. They could have been like, no, <laughs> like stop this now. We don't need people to be scared to come here. This is like a one-off, totally random thing that happened. So yeah. that could very yeah. well have something to do with it. It seems like it was, it was, it was hushed pretty strongly. Yeah. Uh, Bojima knows this was a serious situation. Quote, of course, it's scary. We're human beings. We're not Superman. So if we're stabbed, we're going to die. But we didn't have time to think about it. We had a weapon like him. Now, I know he's talking about the tonk balls, but mm -hmm. I, th I think they had plenty of the other kind as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seriously, like for yeah. real. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you, France24.com, the local.fr, La Parisian, Reuters, The Ledger, EarlyStart.co.uk, Yahoo Sports, FranceHotelGuide.com, and Wikipedia for information contributing to today's story. So, unfortunately, I can't tell you about the sentencing. Um, I'm pretty certain there wasn't a casualty because a lot of these knife attacks, um, there's reporting on it. There's actually kind of a number that has been yeah. kept on this. Um, I don't it's really troubling to think about uh as of since 2015 more than 200 lives have been claimed that's insanity and it's uh, even scarier to think about in a knife attack how often is that fatal like in today's story yeah. we have seven people that are attacked and no fatalities that we know about so if there's to get to that number exactly yeah wow. if there's 200 claimed how many additional people are attacked and surviving that well, and also knife attacks are like a very like personal up close situation. And so that makes it disturbing. Like this yeah. isn't just something where someone can easily close their eyes, point a gun and shoot. Like this person has to physically touch another human being. And that kind of mindset that it takes to do something like that is scary. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know what, what it is about the social component yeah. where like for some reason this type of attack seems to be getting normalized in this area like they've it's it's been just this constant pulse since about yeah. 2015 uh and you know the last one that i was able to see it happened just a few weeks ago six people that were wounded in attacks that happened at a train station in paris um and it's strange because i even went looking for like does this have to do with their gun laws? And I was seeing yeah, some comments where people were that. like, yeah, oh, maybe it's because they're so strict with their guns. Based on what I found, it's not that strict. I mean, yeah, they they have different laws than we do, obviously, and they kind of ratchet down on like higher level assault weapon type stuff, but mm -hmm. you can still have guns in France. This isn't, yeah. it's not like it. it's unheard of. So I don't know, I don't know socially how that happens how something just clicks in and people decide exactly. this is the type it's just it's a terrifying type of attack too you it know really how, is it's very frightening you have seven people that are, have that memory and are sharing that experience um i don't know i don't know also Wild. i did bump into a few current news stories about this area that mm -hmm. since covid happened it's changed and it's actually kind of changed for the worse there appears oh to be, no i was yeah. hoping you would say the opposite <laughs> no heavy heavy drug use in the area <clears throat> which i think is probably also going to be pushing their crime rate up but um based on everything i was seeing and hearing about it like i was like oh wow like if i'm going to paris like that sounds like a place i'd want to check out like a mm -hmm. you know beautiful lake and of course exactly I'm a, I'm a movie fan two of the best cinemas in in france are there um, so I, I hope it gets turned around and I really hope that just like this mentality started for some reason that these yeah. attacks, like, I hope that the mentality for those attacks ending comes along very soon too. Well, I mean, if it's heavily, you know, heavy drug use in that area, it's probably much easier for these people to get their hands on knives and a state of like, yeah, not being mentally stable, you know? And so that probably has something to do with it too. So Good grief. Yeah, yeah well, but let's hope. Before looking into that story, I knew nothing about Patonk at all. And uh, I had never heard of it. Yeah, I had never heard of it. I wound up watching a video that was on YouTube, but it was obviously a VHS tape from the 80s. Oh, boy. That was about the US Patonk League. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it was amazing. Oh, and I'm it pulled sure it me great. right in. Yeah, I was like, okay, I got to learn more about this about this game it sounds fun because i love bocce ball that's like when i go to yeah. the beach that's all i do all day 
Yeah. <laughs> just play bocce ball. I love it. Well, and culturally, similar. like it seems like, you know, they've got these courtyards just set up in random places. That is and, awesome. Yeah. Like out here, it's, you know, it's cornhole. Out here, it's bags. Like if you go yeah, to, that's uh, true. Mm -hmm. you know, you go to a brewery or something like that, they've always got cornhole. Well, we got some horseshoes where I. Hey, there we go. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got some extra stories for you guys to tell. And I think Danielle's going to start it off. Oh, yeah. We got some extra stories. I've been waiting for this. This is one of those research jobs where like there there were lots of stories, but so many of them that were so ridiculous were small. Yes. So I saved I saved some good ones for that. <laughs> so 40 year old George Olivieri had intentions of robbing a convenience store in 2008. But when he arrived, he realized that he had no way to intimidate the staff into giving him what he wanted, which was money. So he glanced around for ideas and being in Florida, there's plenty of one particular thing. And George thought to himself, what a perfect weapon. So in he ran, wielding a palm tree frond, <laughs> no. jabbing it at authorities. And there are photographs of this. And it's not just like, I mean, it's massive. It's massive. A palm it's like frond? They, yes. <laughs> It like looks like someone chopped off the top of a Christmas tree and it's just like waving it like a wild person. Wow. And he is just jabbing this thing at the employees, demanding that they hand over the cash that they're going to get it. And not only does this tie into the most bizarre weapon, but guys, he also is the perfect costume criminal. Uh -oh. he's, he's like, you know what? No one will ever recognize me with my T-shirt pulled over the top of my head. Oh, no. <laughs> not even like in front of his face it's like the the front collar's like resting right at his mouth you can still see the entirety of his face but he's got like the back of it like caught you know, onto his forehead that uh, that's not even the first time i've heard of that why do people think that that's a good I disguise i don't have any idea <laughs> yeah i'm gonna pull a t-shirt up over my head you can't tell who i am no absolutely not <laughs> no one's gonna remember me either even though i'm wielding a wow. palm tree frond and don't worry we're still not done yet because he also had one more weapon no. In between his threats with the palm tree, he was wielding chonklas, flip-flops. He was what? wielding flip-flops. So, like, I don't even know, okay? But what he wasn't expecting, however, because we're still not done yet, was that another customer was going to have a weapon of their own. Hot dog tongue. With no warning, the thief was shoved out of the door by a stool-wielding hero. Wow. All right. We've got a hero with a weapon. Yeah. There's a whole bunch going on here. Now, George ended up being found only blocks away after his failed robbery attempt, and he was arrested. I was never able to find what exactly the charges were or what happened with that, but what mm. on earth? What mm. on earth? <laughs> yeah. I like that. Using a stool to get him out. <laughs> I know. There's a lot happening in that little story. Yeah. Well, Danielle, I know you're not going to believe this, but my story, also from Florida. <laughs> surprise yeah fort walton beach to be exact it was december of 2016 and 37 year old amber costler was being arrested at her home after a domestic dispute but amber wasn't going to go quietly they cuffed her they put her in the police cruiser and she was kicking the door all the way to jail like some type of florida crime magician she actually got out of her handcuffs during the drive and when the door opened she attempted to use them as a weapon against the deputies. Oh, no. And, you know, handcuffs, once you get them open, you can get that little hook, little sharp. They're going to hurt somebody. Yeah. 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 So how did they respond? They fired off a taser round, but it didn't stop her. Oh, no. Then, what is up with these relentless criminals? <laughs> yeah. So then she used her teeth as a weapon, biting a deputy. Thankfully, they finally got her into a holding cell. But Danielle, she's not done. Oh, she's no. not done. Oh, no. De deputies began to smell smoke in the building. And thinking it was an electrical fire, they had to evacuate the prisoners. They went to check on Amber and saw the cause. A roll of toilet paper in her cell was engulfed in flames. How did she start the fire, Danielle? That's what I am trying to figure out. Well, it turns out that there was another type of roll involved. They watched surveillance video and found that they missed something in the pat down. She no. pulled a lighter from, quote, a roll of body fat in her buttocks. <laughs> <laughs> and then she used it to start the fire. 
She had a lighter in a roll of body fat in her buttocks. Who did... <laughs> She's like, oh, I'm going to hide this here for safekeeping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or did it, did, it, did it happen when she sat on the couch? Did she accidentally sit Seriously, and like, how it? did that even happen and get there? Good grief. I, she was on a roll. I don't know. She was on a roll. Uh, Florida, I just have a request. Please give this woman a magic show because mm -hmm. she was a magician. She gets out of handcuffs. She produces items. I know, just like out of nowhere. <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> That's right. No one was injured, thankfully, and she tacked on a few more charges, including resisting arrest and arson. Man, these people. Yeah. Now, my final story takes the cake, okay? October 2021. Okay. Authorities in Madison County, Florida. <laughs> No. Uh, I'm not joking. <laughs> oh, my goodness. They respond to a robbery at a local Waffle House. Other okay. Look, Waffle House is like the restaurant version of Walmart, at least where I'm from, in terms of crazy things happening. I have covered a few stories that happened at Waffle House. Yep, absolutely. It's something else. So mm -hmm. authorities respond. And upon questioning employees, this was a robbery like no other. So that night, 28-year-old Edward Rodriguez walked into this Waffle House with his little dog in tow, like they walk in together. Okay. But he was not there for their delicious hash browns. Oh, no, absolutely not. That would be unreasonable. He pulled out his trusty weapons because this was a stick-up. But the response from customers was one of confusion because no one knew if this was a joke or not because the weapon in question finger guns <laughs> <laughs> hold on a second <laughs> did he think he was gonna be able to pull that off <laughs> he did finger guns waving in the air he is as serious as a heart attack yells at everyone to get on the ground he's like get on the ground this is a robbery still confused as all get out they watch him as a very serious rodriguez proceeds to rampage Rampage around the entire Waffle House, you guys, with these finger guns up in the air, threatening people as he proceeds to grab every single napkin he can find in the building. Yeah. Just as fast as the robbery began, it ended as Rodriguez takes off with all of the napkins. <laughs> that is awesome. The authorities <laughs> found Rodriguez, who admitted to the crime, but since he technically didn't really use weapons because it was his hands he was charged right. with unarmed robbery and assault of what he took napkins did he, he try sure to did. pay did he try to pay his bail in napkins honestly he probably <laughs> could have according to like how many he took i mean just like and he was well, very serious like ran in there screaming pointing his gun at people and like just took all the napkins and took off i mean it sounds like he's tripping and if he's Has tripping like Has does does he think that the napkins are money? Like when they found him, was he counting his napkins? <laughs> Stop it. I just got $5,000. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's trying to pay off the officer. Well, just let me go. Here, I'll let yeah. you keep half of this. <laughs> oh, goodness. I'm telling you, I saw this. I was like, man, I wish I could have like been a fly on the wall. Yeah. yeah. Because like what on earth? I want to know what what he's doing. Is he on something? Like I, I don't know. know. That's Gotta something. Be. Something's Gotta going be. on there. Uh, Danielle, I went looking for the oldest bizarre weapon story, and I think I found it in an article at Live Science. In what is being called the world's oldest narrative carving, a story found in Florida. You're no, joking. No, it's actually Turkey. But I was I like, just, oh, no, are you joking right now? This can't be real. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's the country of Turkey. A story found in Turkey carved into stone about 11,000 years ago tells the harrowing tale of two young men being chased by menacing animals, including leopards and bulls, while one man appears to be holding a snake to use as a weapon to defend himself. Mm -hmm. The other man is clearly holding his snake, Danielle. I just don't know. I don't know if that's going to do the damage that he's expecting it to. I don't know. I I wouldn't. I, I'm wondering, like, is that to show that he was scared that he's holding his snake? 
<laughs> or like he's covering it like yeah like, a way, like, a, it's like a protection <laughs> yeah because the description and i've seen some pictures of it like they really drew a lot of detail in terms yeah. of the teeth on the leopards <laughs> like is he worried about being bitten <laughs> um yeah so his buddy is holding what looks it does it literally looks like a snake but he is clearly holding his snake an archaeologist would say unfortunately while the neolithic hunter may have easily recognized its message we are still lacking an understanding of the actual narrative uh, <laughs> yeah no kidding <laughs> I feel like we have to be missing something here because this isn't making sense. What are those? <laughs> I, I want to say it so bad, but I can't say it on this show. You know those photos that men send to women that they shouldn't? This is like yeah. the first. This is the first of the those photos. The very first one? Oh, the my pics. goodness. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, the archaeologist also says it's giving them fascinating new insight. Mm -hmm. And he's looking forward to seeing more. Well... <laughs> okay then <laughs> yeah i don't know that archaeologist seems to enjoy his job a little too much oh <laughs> uh, danielle who oh. is going to win this month we have bees against balls it's been an episode let me just tell you honestly i think you might need to win just from that last story alone i don't know um, yeah, that was a good story it was a good one but <laughs> <laughs> it's not up to me you guys get to vote who brought the best most bizarre weapon part two story and you can vote over at our twitter account at crime after pod for the first seven days after the episode drops or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and you can vote there we also always have a link in the description box down below if you're watching on youtube and then you can also click the little letter i in the corner and cast your vote yeah this is kind of this is kind of like a big one though i feel like because this is like this is a big one this is a big one this, <laughs> this is, is a big one <laughs> spend, spend some time. our friendship i'm just kidding <laughs> yeah give it some thought because if she wins too many in a row my feelings are going to be really hurt and we're never going to talk again is that what is it would be we're... sad let's not do that <laughs> no we're not going to do that <laughs> But spend some time over at Crime After Crime Podcast. There you'll find all the links that you ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store. And as always, a huge thank you to our patrons. We have so much fun over there. You guys get a bonus Patreon special segment monthly. They are always entertaining. I do monthly farm updates. You hear about all those shenanigans, and you just get to know us better plus patrons and get a personal shout out and an upcoming patreon special we've got we've got an adventure filled patreon special coming up absolutely this yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. interesting story on the farm update uh don't forget you can come and meet us plus attend our final episode at crime con orlando in september of 2023 come and meet up with us for the big finale how do you get your name on the guest list and a bunch of free crime after crime swag i'm glad you asked Visit CrimeCon.com and buy a standard CrimeCon pass today using the code CRIMEAFTERCRIME with no spaces. And then email your receipt to CRIMEAFTERCRIME at LordAndArts.com. That's CRIMEAFTERCRIME at L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S dot com. The sooner the better because we do have a limited number of seats and swag, so don't miss out. That's right. And we are just rolling with this last season in terms of great topics. Mm -hmm. I, I loved the paranormal one. Yep, it was great to go back to bizarre weapons, but guys, I I might be more excited about next month's <laughs> smelliest crime. I'm honestly a little scared about what I'm gonna have to look into. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's gonna be scary research, but I'm pretty sure the stories are gonna be worth it. Oh, it's S gonna be a good one. I got a feeling. Smelliest crime. Today's show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Howland, and the amazing, outstanding John Lorden. Why, thank you. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. And you guys, have a great month, and we will see you again soon on Crime After Crime. Take care, everybody. Bye.